so thank you all for coming today, and, uh, import and most importantly, uh, thanks to our speakers. Uh, I've spent uh, many years in Silicon Valley, and I know it's uh, people are in getting investors to come to, to conferences and really start to uh, integrate in the community, I think, is important, and it's something we've done very uh, well here in L.A. Um, I'm going to let each one of the speakers introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their investment thesis. Just quickly, with respect to me and my firm, uh, I'm a corporate and securities partner uh, at Wilson, Sonsini, Goodrich, and Rosati, uh, which is the largest law firm uh, based in Silicon Valley. And we are um, also in all the major technology markets uh, around the country and uh, increasingly around the world. Um, so if you want to talk to me to, today about any sorts of issues uh, relating to um, uh, setting up a company or getting it financed, I'm more than happy to speak to you and a few of my colleagues are here as well. Um, so I'm going to, as the, as the uh, first part of the panel, I'd like each, uh, each one of our um, uh, investors to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about your firm and your investment thesis. Uh, what, are the, what are the things that are interesting you right now? Um, and if you've got a... Um, a specific portfolio company or some and, and, and a company that you've invested in that's been recently that's been particularly intriguing. Feel free to use this as an opportunity to to pitch them as well. Uh, hi, I'm James Conlon from Bullpen Capital, and we uh, are the are a dedicated post seed fund or the small A fund. So uh, the whole focus is you've once you've raised money from the institutional seed investors. Um, found product market fit, and then have a near-term milestone in the next nine to 12 months. You raise maybe a two to three uh, A round to keep it lean a little longer, hit those milestones, and then raise the next round at a much bigger valuation. Um, so it's an alternative to the to the more traditional seven or eight million A that goes around these days. Um, big uh, big L LA deal just got announced finally. Uh, Ipsy finally raised. Uh, so they'd raised very little along the way, and then uh, found an opportunity for growth here down in LA. We're in FanDuel. We're in a a couple of big ones that you're probably sick of seeing on TV in that regard, but uh, yeah, that's the goal. Well, uh, I'm TX Suo, uh, partner at Carlin Ventures, uh, one of the local LA VCs. Uh, invest a lot in marketplaces and enterprise software. Uh, been around for about four years right now. Um, pretty intrigued by uh, the customer support as a service space as well as marketplaces that deliver value to consumers. So. Uh, one space that we've looked at a lot would be medical overbilling. So uh, very excited about this new company. We led an investment in San Francisco called uh, Remedy Lab. So excited about the uh, company, the team, as well as our co-investors. I believe uh, we have another co-investor here with me. Um, so that's pretty much what we do. My name is Eric Ranala um, with Mucker Capital. We're a seed stage fund uh, here in LA. Uh, we also run what is uh, ostensibly an accelerator program called Mucker Lab. Uh, Seed stage, so the nomenclature is a little bit of a moving target. So we invest in uh, rounds that are typically the first institutional round of funding. Usually they're you know one to two million dollars, and we'll invest anywhere from a couple hundred thousand up to like 750. And then uh, with Mucker Lab, we work with companies and invest in companies that are kind of the stage right before that. Uh, we uh, invest in both kind of enterprise and consumer companies. So we look pretty broadly at anything that's software enabled. So anything kind of internet or software enabled is, is, uh, is where we invest. Uh, we're principally focused on companies here in LA. So most of our portfolio is here in LA, but we do invest outside LA. Some of the LA companies we've invested in are uh, companies like the Black Tux, which is an online tuxedo rental service. A company called Surf Air, which is a membership-based subscription airline. Um, and a company called Service Titan, uh, which is a uh, uh, B2B SaaS business here in LA. Uh, Peter Lee at Broda Ventures. Uh, we're also a seed fund based in LA. Um, typically looking at very similar uh, spaces. Um, Pre-seed, seed, seed uh, consumer web, SaaS, e-commerce, mobile, ad tech. Um, we're typically writing checks around 100K to half a million dollars. Uh, about 20% of our investments are pre-product, so we are very willing to go early for good teams. Uh, the vast majority are typical seed uh, stage companies raising, you know, one to two million dollars. Um, we are investors in uh, Dog VK, Surf Air, uh, Remedy with TX, so a lot of co-investments with some of the guys up here. Okay. So how many of you in the audience are um, entrepreneurs seeking financing right now, just to get a sense of, you know, a, quite a good number, so that's good. Um, um, so for my first question, or for my more substantive question, um, LA is a market with a lot of early stage capital, at least in terms of the quantity. But when you sort of compare it to a market like Silicon Valley, it's, it's, it has a, 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 
an infrastructure that's come a long way over the last five years, but it's it's still developing in terms of you know, mentorship for early, uh, the you know the the idea that you know just the quantity of entrepreneurs that you have that you can sort of look to for mentors and to give you advice about um, how to go out and get that first uh, first early seed financing. Um, so, from your perspective as investors, what advice would you give to the audience about? Um, uh, uh, identifying the right kinds of investors and, and raising that, that early stage seed capital here in LA. And James, we can start yeah, with sure. you. Um, always good to get a warm intro, um, but I think the question may be more tailored for people that are trying to break in initially. And the, I think the best advice I can give in LA is to show up and volunteer. Uh, it's a really tight knit ecosystem. And if you try to pin one of us down after this panel and talk to us for 30 seconds, it's gonna be kind of an interruption. It's gonna be difficult to get your your company across, but showing up at Mucker or Amplify or, or some event nearby and just volunteering, you've got access to everybody there for eight hours. Uh, you're pitching in, you're showing that you're a part of the community and you're getting advice the whole way. You're getting your, uh, building your network, building your, your mentor group. And I've seen, I've seen a lot of successes come out of guys that just showed up out of like an MBA class or something like that to come volunteer and, and uh, became a success through that, through that route. I think that's great advice. I mean, not much more to add on, uh, except to say that LA is actually a very small ecosystem when it comes to investors. So I think once you sort of break into that circle, it's very easy for you to get access to all the people you want to speak to. So definitely through warm introductions, but I'd say if you put in the effort, uh, LA, it's a pretty, I wouldn't say easy, but I would say less complicated ecosystem to navigate. Yeah, I mean, I would agree warm intros, you know, are always good for investors, but I guess even even stepping back a little bit, I would try to make as much progress as you can uh, before approaching kind of firms or fund investors or professional investors. You know, get as much done as you can building the product or you know uh, offering the service without a product or uh, you know do do sort of a, a a low fidelity version of it. Test the market. Test your customer acquisition tactics. Do as much as you possibly can on a small or limited budget prove out some of your core hypotheses, uh, then maybe try to raise money from friends and family or angels, you know, keep, keep going. Uh, I, I wouldn't try to go from kind of zero to raising venture capital right away because I think that's often difficult. I would try to take as many incremental steps along the way as you can, prove out, you know, little pieces or even big pieces of your hypothesis, make progress so that when you do get to kind of fund investors that you, you have a story to tell some you know, some evidence of what you're uh, trying to do, the problem you're trying to solve, and, you know, and the solution you're building. Yeah, I would echo what Eric said. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially first-time entrepreneurs, it's hard to break in. It's hard to go up to a VC when you have no track record and say, hey, take an hour and hear my thoughts. Um, so if you're a first-time entrepreneur, it's all about, I call it hacking. Um, you spend time on your business plan. Spend time on thinking through the market. But... Don't worry so much about building something amazing. Just hack whatever you can to get data. And so the company that TX you know, led and I participated in, you know, rather than building a, a mobile app first, they just went out, friends and family, got a bunch of medical bills, and they started working with them to solve the problem. And they got a lot of great data, and now they're building the actual product. Um, we have another company um, early on. I mentioned Dog Vacay. He didn't think about building the company and the website first. He just started watching dogs and started seeing the amount of demand there was. Spent $25 on a Craigslist ad to see if there are people interested in watching dogs you know, to get paid. He got 200 resumes in like a day. And so he started doing things without trying to wireframe a website and trying to prove this out. You, know, you just get the data. And having that kind of information when you go to an uh, investor to say, hey, we, we, we haven't just thought about the business and the industry, but here are some actual data from customers. Here's how we're proving out you know, the, the customer demand. That's a lot more telling for me about your, your ability to create action, not just thought. The, the other thing I would add, too, is um, you know, very early on when you're just getting started, uh, instead of necessarily asking people just for money, I would ask people for help and advice. So there are lots of people who, you know, if you ask them to, them for money, their initial reaction is going to be to start judging where you are in the evolution of your business and whether you're ready for financing and what kind of financing and how much. And you know, you, you can change, I think, the conversation a little bit by finding people who may or may not be investors, but sincerely going and asking people for help and advice. And then that 
can sort of evolve into a relationship that you have with other founders or other uh, executives or investors even um, and build that relationship over time without sort of starting, you know, starting from hello to give me money right away and, and sort of trying to get advice and help along the way building the business and often that'll kind of turn into money uh, without you having to ask. Um, and, and those comments about all the affirmative things you should be doing in developing your pitch are actually a good lead into my next question, which is, are there any clear mistakes that you see entrepreneurs frequently make that just cause you to, it's, it weakens the pitch from the beginning uh, and is going to make it that much more challenging for the investor to, to get your interest? I don't want to see your demo. Um, <laughs> so I love this question because I love being able to say this. And part of that is the, the stage where I invest. but. Um, show up with traction, show up with something, a question that you answered, something that you figured out. Uh, and since if you're coming to Bullpen, you'll already have institutional seed investors and to some degree they've vetted the product. But if you're in love with your product and you keep pushing that, but we can't talk about the operations plan, we can't talk about how you're gonna bring that product to market or grow that product over the next 12 months, um, how beautiful it is or anything like that, how seamless everything looks isn't gonna sway my decision, so that's almost the last box I check at the end as opposed to something that you, uh, I've had entrepreneurs continue pushing it and continue pushing it and then almost get personally insulted when we didn't want to see it. So um, let's talk about the nuts and bolts of your business as opposed to just the, just the product. I think for me, it's just as simple as doing some of your background homework, right? Uh, I can't tell you the number of times someone comes to me and pitches me a company that's completely outside our wheelhouse, right? Hey, we're trying to raise 100 million bucks. Would you want to speak to us? I mean, I'm just making this up as, as an example, but I think sort of knowing the sector focus of the person you're speaking to and his background is very important. Uh, the other thing, I think once you get into a conversation, it's about releasing the agenda. I think a lot of times it's more of a conversation between us, the investors, and you. We want to learn more about you, learn more about the company but you've rehearsed this pitch so many times that you just want to stick to the script, and that's usually a, a very painful conversation at the end of the day. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of the, I'm sure everyone's heard this before, but I think a lot of the advice about getting an introduction you know, is really true. Trying to sort of reinvent the wheel about how you meet people or, or being really creative, like overly creative or ambushing people, you know, at, at uh, you know, other venues or something like that when they're not actually in a position to have a conversation are actually just tough because it's tough to like absorb the, absorb the conversation. Um, and, and then I think the other thing I would say is, especially with venture investors, you kind of don't need to ask them for money explicitly. Their job is actually to invest in companies they're interested in. So just by meeting them in a context, telling them about what you're doing, getting to know them, if they're interested in what you're doing, they're gonna, they're gonna ask you to invest. So I think, um, you know, like James said, and, and these other guys, I think by, you know, uh, being passionate about the business, having a story, having something, you know, share, maybe asking advice, getting to know people, I think that's going to lead to lead to that happening. Just asking, you know, more frequently and more vigorously, you know, usually isn't gonna isn't gonna change someone's mind. Yeah. So um, especially for the entrepreneurs who are starting off from scratch, um, there's a lot of talk of product market fit. Um, but I guess for me, over the last couple of years, I've been spending a lot more time thinking about founder market fit. Um, and I joke around about like you have four MBAs coming out of school and they think about what industry is right for disruption. They pick construction even though none of them have any background construction. And they do all the research. And it's like, I guess it's possible that you can build something great out of that. Um, I personally get much more interested when I see a founder who is attacking a problem they understand intimately because um, they know the space and it's not an academic exercise. And so, you know, as you think about you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to, you know, create something amazing, you know, start from your own experiences and it just it sometimes feels very inauthentic when I hear pitches and they just, there's no connection with the founder and the problem they're solving. Um, so that's a big mistake I see. So, so one more question as we're starting to run out of time, but I think it's a, an important one. Um, valuations. Uh, Jeremy alluded in the last presentation to uh, you know the, the frothiness of the market that uh, there there seems to be an investment or that there's seems to be interest in pretty in practically any area. Um, and I know Bill Gurley for you know seems like every six months or so is quoted somewhere as talking about a bubble. I'd like to ask the question a little bit differently. If, if you were advising a founder or had a, a portfolio company that was looking at doing a financing in the current market. 
um, and they had the opportunity to raise uh, more capital now at, a, at what they think is a lower valuation than what they can get in six and 12 months. How would you uh, advise them to, uh, to sort of look at that, uh, and that capital raising opportunity and how much money to raise? And then one sort of, a, as just as a second question, if you could comment briefly on it. Uh, one of you was quoted a few years ago as saying there's a 30% discount in the LA market to, um, to, the, to the valuation that you would get in Silicon Valley. Has that gap closed at all? Uh, so as an entrepreneur, you can control when and how much you raise, and I'm not in the camp of raise as much as you can, as soon as you can, when the money's there. Um, keep your options open. You know, we, our, our very first deal got bought for like 80 million nine months after we invested, and if they had taken the 8 million check that they had on the table instead of the three that we wrote them, that is like zero money for the founder because you're so deep under the preference stack that there's, it's not a good outcome. Um, so maintain your options, see what kind of company you have, turn over one more card, uh, and go that route. And then in terms of valuations, we've seen companies get really flattered by an early stage valuation that's just like way off the charts. So at the next round, when you get a more sophisticated or more price sensitive investor, you're either gonna be forced to take a down round and nobody wants to give you that signaling and then be involved in the company, or um, you, know, you just can't raise at that point. So you're, you're caught in this bind where you got flattered by an early valuation, but uh, your numbers will never support that at the next round. And you kind of shoot yourself in the foot as an entrepreneur that way, so just, just field questions about what the right valuation will be in terms of making sure you can hit the next milestones and keep that, keep that path rolling properly. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to add to that, I think sort of valuations should always be the secondary question. I think uh, the more important question is what are you gonna use that capital for? What are you gonna use the money for? I mean, if you're gonna put it to good use, then you should be raising money. If not, I mean, if you're just gonna pad the bank account with more money that you can use, then that's probably not the best time to raise money. Yeah, I think, I think it's always, you know, good to have a little bit of a buffer or, or you know, a little bit of a, a of padding, but um, but I would think about it in terms of bottoms up, right? How much capital do you actually need uh, to accomplish, you know, the next set of milestones or, or get you to either profitability or cash flow positive or the next round of financing? More is not always better, and there's, there's a bunch of evidence that suggests that overfunding a company actually uh, is bad for it and can have negative consequences. So, you know, there, it's correlated to kind of premature scaling, and, and you know, premature scaling is the, the, the number one uh, cause of death of startups. So uh, there's an argument to be made for, for not raising too much. Now, that's not to say don't raise enough or raise less than you need, but uh, I would think about it bottoms up, about how much you actually need. Maybe have a little bit of buffer, but, uh, but not just raise as much as you can at the highest valuation you can. Yeah, and no other specific comments. I think I agree with all the other panelists. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for your time today. Um, I'm, this gentleman's holding up a sign that says he means it, time's up. So uh, um, uh, thank you again. Thank you.